Welcome everybody at One Life Church across all of our sites. And the first thing I want to say to you guys before we get into our main message is, and I'm sure it's been said in the service up until now, but I need to say it again. Next week, we are doing an event called Project Playlist. Now, Project Day for us means a day where we imagine there's only unbelieving people in the room. Now, we know that's not going to be the case because we're asking everybody uh, who is a believer to bring someone in their life on their arm that they know don't believe in any of this stuff. And we design the entire experience around talking to them. That means it won't be a normal time. We won't have you stand and sing. won't have a normal sermon or anything like that. What we want to do is make the case that Jesus ought to be believed and followed. Now, here's the very important thing you need to understand about this is that when you bring someone, the goal of a project is not only to speak to people in their own language, we're going to be using the, uh, the topic of music as kind of a bridge building uh, a, topic for people who may not believe, but we're wanting to inspire conversation. We're wanting to inspire exploring of faith. We're not going to just kind of cram the message down their throats and do kind of a turn or burn type of thing. We're hoping that people who have kind of dismissed these ideas, and here in the Bible Belt, a lot of people, they have kind of a caricature in their mind of who Jesus is and what church is and all of that, and they've dismissed that. And what we are hoping to do is kind of come at people from a little bit different angle or a lot different angle, hoping that they will at least reconsider believing who Jesus is. And, and especially with this one, we're really experimenting because we're doing the subject of music. We've never done this before. And we're going to be just kind of taking some approaches we've not taken before. So it should be a great time, but be in prayer about that. And please consider inviting someone in your life that doubts all these things, because I think they'll be moved and they will be uh, opened up to discussing these things. But before we go on to the message, I want to pray for next week because it's very, very critical to our mission. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you very, very much for the opportunity that we have uh, to speak to people's lives and to present you and what you've done on our behalf to people. And we ask for next week's message and the approach, the music, the production, the film, all that we're doing. I ask that you will open people's minds. I ask that you will open people's hearts and that you will do a very, very special thing and that they will be able to consider uh, belief and consider following and trusting you like maybe they haven't done in years. And I pray that you'll set up those kind of divine appointments that we can have where you'll just open up doors where people can be invited and they'll accept the invitation and uh, we'll just have a great time next week. Just open those doors for us and uh, please place your hand of power and blessing on that time. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, for the main uh, part here, I, I want to start with a little bit of a quiz, and uh, it's this. Uh, what do Demi Lovato, Mark Twain, Owen Wilson, J.K. Rowling, Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill, and Gwyneth Paltrow all have in common, besides being uh, you know, roughly famous, give or take, a few things. What do they all have in common? Well, there may be a number of things, but the main thing they have in common is that all of them at one time or the other have been described as, or described themselves as, have been clinically depressed or having struggled with depression in their world. Uh, in, in very, very severe ways. I, to me, uh, Abraham Lincoln is the most interesting uh, character in that whole lineup because there's a, there's a whole book out now called Lincoln's Melancholy. Lincoln's Melancholy was that, that, that Abraham Lincoln was known as being as great as he was, being as amazing as he was, considered by most to be the greatest president in the history of the United States, struggled very, very deeply with depression. When he was 32, Lincoln wrote this. He said it about himself, quote, I am now the most miserable man living. Lincoln's longtime law partner, uh, William Herndon, observed about Lincoln. He said this about his partner-in-law, said, gloom and sadness were his predominant state, and his melancholy dripped from him as he walked. We pictured Lincoln walking kind of stately and everything. He said, actually, this, this feeling of almost gloom kind of dripped off of him. 
Lincoln told one friend of his that he often considered suicide. Now, Lincoln's also known, if you follow his life at all, I ever have, he's also known for telling stories and jokes and everything. He said this about the jokes himself. He said, if it were not for these stories and jokes and jests, I should die. They give me vent. The vents for my moods and gloom. Now, I'm sorry that you might have arrived on Depression Day, okay? Some of you may not have known that, but here's the thing, is that we've been talking in, in the series called Playlist. We've been going through the Psalms in the Bible. And one of the things that we, we dealt with a few weeks ago is that we've asked everybody to pray the Psalms, have them inform their prayers. And you don't get very far into the Psalms before you realize they talk about violence against their enemies. And we talked about the struggle. What do you do with that? Well, another characteristic of the Psalms that you don't have to be in there very long before you notice, and you notice a whole lot, if you stick with them, one of their characteristics is they are saturated with some people that are really, really bummed out. They sound like Abraham Lincoln. I mean, they say some things that you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I kind of get on the sunny side of the street here. This is, they, they get into deep, hard things. Let me give you a sample. This is Psalm 6. You're not in there very long before you encounter this. Listen to these words. The psalm is praised. Oh, Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. Apparently it was sick physically. My soul is also greatly troubled. It's not just my body. My soul is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, you, O Lord, I love this line, how long? In other words, I've, I've been this way for a while and things don't seem to be getting any better. Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for, for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death, there's no remembrance of you. And Sheol, who will give you praise? Listen to these lines. I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. And this guy's down. Have you ever languished before? Have you ever just uh, flooded your bed with tears? Have you ever been there before? Well, if you stick with the Psalms, you'll hear people talk that way. Now, one of the things that we've said is very, very important about the Psalms is they cover all the different, the length and breadth and all the movements of the human soul. And the thing about it is all of us at one time or the other have either experienced times like that or we will. Now, I said today's kind of depression day. That's a little bit of an exaggeration. Actually, I don't want to use so much the topic of depression, although I want to include it. Because in our day, as we talk about depression, it's kind of got a clinical definition. And some people actually are kind of defined that way or being treated that way or what have you. And I want to include that. But I'm going to use the metaphor today of darkness. How do we navigate dark times? Because while some of us may have been categorized kind of depressed, all of us at one time or the other have, have most likely been in times of darkness. And we'll go through days of darkness, either a day or a season or a year. I've been very open about the fact that I've, I, that I've struggled with this topic for most of my life. I, I think there's kind of a scale. Over here, there would be people who might be defined by professionals as clinically depressed, and over here, there are people who have barely kind of touched on darkness much at all. By the way, no one likes you very much. You need to know that, okay? And, and then they're, they're, we all kind of run along a scale one way or the other. And I, I kind of tip over this way. I do, off and on throughout my life. I can name years. 1994, one of the darkest years of my life. 2009. 2016. Told you about that one, 2006. Well, but 2016 seemed to be that way for the whole world. Did you notice that? Except for Cubs fans. It's kind of just it's kind of this dark time. But the question becomes, and what's cool about the Psalms is I think it answers it in a way. How do you navigate the dark times? How do you navigate the dark places? And that's what we're going to be looking at the Psalms for today. How do you navigate the dark places? Well, the first one, and I think kind of the underlying principle to navigating dark places in our lives is you have to acknowledge there are such things. And that's this beauty of the Psalms. You have to acknowledge that there are such things as dark places. Acknowledge them to yourself. 
And that sounds kind of simple, but sometimes I, I, I don't think it is quite so much in faith-filled environments. Because I'm talking about those of us who would label ourselves as believers in Jesus. People who have come to him and we've followed him and we want him to lead our lives. Sometimes, if we're being really honest, it's hard to admit, and it almost feels shameful to admit in some ways, that we're in a dark place or we've seen dark places. But what the Psalms do, and we just saw a moment ago, is they give expression to it. And the first thing, if you're, if you're going to navigate a dark place, you've got to acknowledge that there is such a thing. But you can do it in kind of artful words. That's what the Psalms do so beautifully. Um, one of the Psalms that I, it's just, I love because it describes what it's really like to really be in darkness. Listen to what it says. Save me, O God. I sink in deep, oh, I'm sorry. Save me, O oh God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there's no foothold. I've come into deep waters and the floods sweep over me. I'm weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim waiting for my God. If you've ever been into a place that's kind of over in this territory, it's a wonderful yet terrible description of what it's like. I can still remember when I was a kid, I, mean, I don't know, I was probably eight years old or so, myself and my cousin, family and brothers and sisters, we, we, we were out swimming in a lake. You know, you do as kids, and there was one of those docks out in the middle of the lake. It was way far off. We made it out there, and we were jumping into that. And, and I was out in water that was deep. And I can still remember the sensation. At one point, I got too tired. I got too far away from the dock or whatever. And, and, and the water was up to here, and I was running out of energy. And you kind of start, kind of, you look for a foothold, and you don't have a foothold. And that's exactly what dark places feel like when they're really, truly dark. Because you scan the horizon, you, it's, it's almost like you, 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 you bring to your mind, oh, there's a foothold, there, there would be something that would give me hope, or that would give me hope, and you literally can't find it, and I'm sinking in the deep, and the water's come up to my neck, and there's, there's no foothold to be found anywhere, I can't find anything. All the traditional little cliches are not working, because people don't quite get it. I had a friend of mine that used to deal with this stuff very, very deeply, I told him, he's I watched him as, as you would give him a hopeful thing, and he could almost always navigate his way around it. He could always just kind of come up with a reason why that wasn't true for him. Ever been there way before? There's no foothold? Well, the thing about it is the psalmist had. And he was able to articulate it. He was able to talk about it. He was able to express it. And the psalms express it in this wondrous, amazing, artful way. Where it's like whenever you read that stuff, and what's happened to me, having, you know, kind of being on this side of the scale, a number of times, the reason I love the Psalms so much is I would read something like that and go, wow, this God gets me. He knows what's going on. And this psalmist, even if it's just he and I that have been through this, it meant the world to know that there was a, there was a, it was expressed. There was a get it factor somehow. And that leads me to the next critical thing. If we're going to navigate dark places, we've got to acknowledge that there are such things individually. We can say that, that there are. But we need to acknowledge that corporately. I'm going to read for you what is arguably the most depressing psalm in all 150 psalms. Aren't you glad you came today? This is great. You know, you're welcome. We're going to read the most depressing one because here's what you need to know. That... Um, Scholars have said, I remember reading a commentator years ago who said as many as 70 plus percent of the Psalms have this depressing thing kind of going on in them. And they actually, they have a name. There's a genre name called laments. The Psalms that are kind of dark and talk out of frustration or depression, they're called laments. And one of the scholars has said that as many as 70 percent of the Psalms have laments kind of in them. But most of them when they start, they start very, very dark, but by the time they're done, they get light again. They're, they're kind of, they'll start in this dark place, but then they'll get hopeful. I'm going to read you the psalm, one of like two, <laughs> that never gets hopeful. It just stays bad, stays dark. I'm not going to uh, read the middle part of it just in the interest of time, but I'm going to read a pretty good chunk of it. But before I do, listen, listen to what it says about the psalm. It gives you this little note like most of the psalms do. 
because it says, here's the occasion it was written for. Listen to what it says. A song, a song of the sons of Korah, to the choir master, according, then it gives some technical musical language of Heman the Ezraite. Now, notice what it says. It says, to the choir master. Now, why that's significant? Because the Psalms were presented publicly. What they had was they, they had choirs there at the temple. When they would worship God, they would, they would be in this place where they, they would be given music. And they would lead the people in worship to God together. And this song that we're about to read, the lyrics to this song, it was presented to the choir master. One scholar believed it was from a man who was suffering from leprosy. He had passed it on to someone else. He was talking about his experience. But it's very important to note that the Psalms were public when they were written, and they've been public for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries, going back thousands, a thousand years before Jesus, right? That's very important as you listen to these words, and I'll t- tell you why. But listen to what he says. O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol as their place of death. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength, like one set loose from among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions of the dark and deep. But I cry to you, O Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. And then you hear him getting hopeful, but then listen to what he says. Oh, Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I'm helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. And here's the last line. My companions have become darkness. The end. Wow. That's in there? You know, the Bible claims about itself that God himself, God Almighty, maker of the universe, took the writers of the scriptures, like we just read, and he breathed through them, and he used their personality and their circumstances to give us the words that he wanted us to have. He wanted us to have those words. Isn't that weird? A psalm that starts bad, ends bad. Why? And it was presented publicly. You see, we've got to acknowledge that there are dark places, but we need to do it publicly. You know Why? Because one of the minds that one of the tricks that your mind plays on you when you're in dark places is that I'm all by myself. And not only that, I, I'm, I'm, this guy felt forsaken by God. I'm cut off from God and I'm cut off from anyone else. Here's what can easily happen to us. I don't think we say this out loud, but it pretty much comes with what we don't say, especially in Christian environments. We go, Jesus died for our sins and he rose again from the dead. There's so much to be joyful about. And that's absolutely true. But it can give you the idea, if you start going through a dark place, that somehow you've done something wrong or you're, you're, yeah, no one can relate to you. God alone can't relate to you, not to, not to mention everybody else around you. And yet, in this place, they read those things corporately. They, they, they made them a part of corporate worship. Why did they do that? To acknowledge the very fact that this stuff goes on in the faith community, inside of it. They didn't consider it unusual or strange or weird or to be shunned. They made this a part of how we talk to God because they knew that if you stick around life long enough, if you walk with Jesus long enough, listen, you are going to go through dark stuff. It's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And it doesn't mean he's not faithful. It doesn't mean that he's not there or that he's even done any of these things that this man is talking about. Is the Bible saying that God really did forsake him? No. But God God allowed those words to be expressed. 
he allowed this guy to say, this is what it feels like. It feels like God himself has cut me off. I, I told you a couple weeks ago, we were talking about the anger thing, that I, was, I did an illustration and I said, I'm going to do it again before we're done with the series. That was a few weeks back and, and I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it today. And the reason I'm doing it is some of you didn't hear it, but, but second of all, those of you who did hear this, if there's not any other thing that I want you to get from the Psalms, it's this illustration. And I, I, I don't want to call it the Psalm wheel, but it's kind of tempting, but I won't do that because that would be very dumb. Um, we said a while ago that the Psalms cover, we quoted the great church father Athanasius. He said, the Psalms cover all the movements of the human soul. And what you learn from the psalmist is that their journey to God could begin from any place. You see, these are, these are all, these, not all, but these list off the different experiences that we have, the different movements of our soul. We're sad, we're excited, we're disillusioned. We're enthusiastic, we get angry, sometimes we feel pure, sometimes we feel sinful, sometimes we feel doubtful, sometimes we feel hopeful, sometimes we feel happy, and on and on and on it goes. And here's what you learn from the Psalms. And it's very, very important, especially in the dark place, to recognize that you can start from right here. Now here's why this is so important. I'm convinced, especially in kind of church environments, that we often subconsciously communicate, even corporately, that if you're here, in order to get here, you've got to go here first. You've somehow got to get to your happy place, or you've got to get to a hopeful place, and then you can get to God. And the Psalms confirm over and over and over and over and over again, that's not true. Here's the thing I learned, and I told you in 2016, this is where I lived. And I went to dark places, and I did. I <laughs> drenched my bed with tears many, 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 many times. It was just one of those seasons of life. I remember waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and your mind does these numbers on you, and it just challenges you and charges you. And you know what happens? The most important move, it's as if a voice is calling out to you from a way, way distant place. The one thing you need to do is turn to God, but it's not, hey, be hopeful. No, turning to God just simply meant start right here. And dare to tell him, and this is sometimes the hardest thing to do, I'd be inside my own head, just kind of almost feeling forsaken by him. Sometimes I felt like he had removed his hand of blessing from my life. Really did feel that way. But you know what he wanted me to do? What he wanted me to say? He wanted me just to take that very simple act of saying, God, opening with that word, or Lord, it feels like you've taken your blessing away from my life. But at that moment, just that one little simple act of expressing it began the journey here. It didn't pop me out of it, didn't make me happy all of a sudden. But what it did do was it made me relate to him. And guys, the reason it has to be expressed corporately, and we need to talk about these kinds of psalms that don't paint a pretty picture, is because we need to let everybody know you're not some oddball if you're going through that. If you feel forsaken or if you're, you're down or you're, you're, you're hurting, that's part of the package it does. And at any given time, any number of us are going through that. The Bible in the New Testament says, rejoice with those who rejoice. For those of you who are doing well, we're supposed to say, way to go, that's awesome. But it says, mourn with those who mourn. Those of us who are in the dark place, we need to be able to look around and not feel like we're strange or odd or out of place. We just happen to be in that place that's reflected like in Psalm 88. Critically important. And guys, it's not just, here's, here's the most important thing. I know the Psalms are in the Old Testament part of the Bible. The New Testament part of the Bible, once I saw that in the Psalms, I could see it in the New Testament. You know there's a place in the Bible where the Apostle Paul himself says at one point he and his team despaired of life itself. 
Do you know even more importantly? Jesus tells his disciples the night before he died, he said, my soul is burdened to the point of death. You know what I find most remarkable? I said, when God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, came to this earth as a man, that's who Jesus is, fully God, fully man, when he walked around, wanted to reveal himself, you know what it says about him, the prophecies about him, what characterized his life? The Bible says he was a man acquainted with grief and familiar with suffering. Jesus didn't come as a motivational speaker. He came as someone who said he carried our burdens, he experienced them, yet without sin. That's the place of hope. He went through death itself. And remember what he prayed from there? My, he went through this experience where he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced all of the darkness you could possibly experience, giving hope on the other side. Well, guys, girls, as we're here today, as we close out, here's what you need to know. The group of us, those of us who call ourselves believers in Jesus, at this moment in whatever site you're at, some of us are doing awesome. It's a good season of life. Some of us are doing pretty good, but others of us are doing pretty bad. We're in dark places. The first thing you need to know is that you're not alone. You weren't alone because the psalmist going back centuries they show you're not alone. Jesus was acquainted with grief. Paul despaired of life. You're not alone. You're right here with friends. And what we want to do today is if you happen to be in a place right now of darkness, we want to have a special prayer time at our campuses. We want you to acknowledge it and have you just acknowledge it from your seat, and our prayer team is going to pray for you, and we're going to play a song. But I, and I know the acknowledgement can be kind of embarrassing or whatever, but that's the whole point. It shouldn't be. Or maybe you're just saying, maybe your heart's broken not for yourself, but just for someone else in your life you know is going through. You'd love for someone to pray for you. That's what we're supposed to be doing for one another as representative of the one who's acquainted with grief and familiar with suffering. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray and now I'm going to release things back to our campuses, and they're going to walk you through a time where maybe we can get some healing in our darkness. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you that you can relate to us. Thank you that you have good things to give those of us who may be struggling very deeply with doubt, with fear, with heartbreak, with physical illness, with relational breakage. All the things that wreck our lives and hurt us deeply. I pray that over these next few moments and in these coming days that you will bring healing, not because you just want us to be happy, but because you want us to be close and intimate with you. We love you. We thank you for who you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.